Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining. I'm just going to wait a, a minute or two to make sure any um, last people have some time to join. So just hang in there and then we'll begin. Okay, hello and welcome to the Future of Air Mobility Accelerator Application Support Webinar. Uh, Leanne, can I have the next slide, please? I am Natasha Giroux. I'm the Program Manager here at Connected Places Catapult. Um, and I'm going to be that annoying person that says next slide, please, because I am not sharing my slides. Leanne is. Um, I'm going to be welcoming you, introducing who we are at Connected Places Catapult and introducing you to the programme. We're then going to hear from Future Flight Challenge UKRI, Sapernal and Crownfield. Those are three of the eight partners on the programme. We are then going to get into the nitty gritty of joining the accelerator. And finally, we do have time for questions. The webinar is being recorded if you need to share it with your teams or rewatch or for those who aren't able to make it today. So an introduction to Connected Places Catapult. Um, next slide, please, Leanne. And the next slide after that. So we are Connected Places Catapult. We're the UK's innovation accelerator for cities, transport and places. We are an independent non-for-profit private organization providing impartial innovation as a service for public bodies, businesses, and infrastructure providers. And we're basically here to catalyze improvements in the way people live, work, and travel. We are one of nine technology centers in the Catapult Network, spanning 40 sites across the UK. Next slide, please. We believe that SMEs are critical to the UK economy. So they do make up 99% of all firms. They contribute to 33% of GDP and 45% of total employment, but they do often struggle to navigate the UK's complex research and innovation ecosystem. So here in the SME development team, the accelerator team is part of that team. We provide support to a network of 4,200 SMEs. And if you're not part of that program yet, I encourage you to Google it and sign up and someone from CPC will be able to reach out to you and see how we'll be able to help and get you involved. To date, the Accelerator team has delivered seven Accelerator programs, totaling 13 cohorts of SMEs. But what do we mean by an accelerator? Well, it's typically a four to six month program supporting a cohort of up to 12 SMEs who have been selected based on challenges driven by industry, governments and local authorities, some of which you can see examples of here. We then develop a bespoke program um, of technical and commercial support designed based on the needs of that winning, winning cohort. Oh, um, sorry, next slide, please. That was the slide I was talking about. Next slide, please, Leanne, apologies. Okay, so how does CPC add value to accelerator programs? Well, we have a diverse technical and market expertise and um, so we can provide support in challenge discovery due diligence etc and through our engagement with smes we've got our network of now 4200 smes that have either taken part in or applied to our opportunities and as a neutral convening power within the market and a government funded agency we have access to key industry 
stakeholders, policymakers, and funding streams to further support SMEs and our partners. Next slide, please. And it works. We uh, collectively, as a team through the accelerators, um, have had a lot of impact. I won't read through all these stats, but 530 jobs have been created, for example, 110 commercial trials, 8 million in, uh, in commercial contracts. And we have some of our um, alumni down at the bottom there. Next slide, please, Deanne. I'm now going to talk about what you really came here for, which is the future of air mobility accelerator. Next slide, please, Leanne. So why did we set up the future of air mobility accelerator? Well, the global aviation market is estimated to be worth about $5.32 billion in 2023. And as a neutral convener with in-house technical expertise, Connected Places Catapult are uniquely placed to support the aviation sector in bringing transformative technologies to market. Next slide, please. So we set up the Future of Air Mobility Accelerator last year, and it's our challenge-led six-month programme in partnership with Future Flight Challenge from UKRI. We will select up to 12 SMEs to join the programme, where they will receive support from a consortium of partners on the trialling and testing of disruptive innovations. And then also you will receive that bespoke support, including investment readiness, technology and product development support and introductions. Next slide, please, Jan. We are really excited to have the following partners in the consortium this year. So Future Flight by UKRI are kindly sponsoring this program and working with us to provide funding uh, for trials through the program. Then we are joined by our strategic partners. So on the industry side, we have Supernal, GKN and Heathrow. On the academic side, Crownfield University and Coventry University, and on the regulatory arm, we have the UK Civil Aviation Authority and the British Standards Institute. So a huge thank you to all our partners. And we're really excited about working with you for a second time on this program. Next slide, please. Last time was, was the first Future of Ambulance Accelerator, and it was a roaring success. As you can see, we provided a lot of support to the SMEs over 700 hours in total, including commercial investment, business models, and technical support from the partners, et cetera. The cohort raised over 5.5 million in investment and over 5.9 million in grant funding. Um, and as well as the 12 trials from the program, we also helped the SMEs secure 19 contracts directly through the introductions we were able to make and collectively the cohort secured in total 175 contracts from the experience and um, development gained through the program so that's an indirect result next slide please you've heard enough from me so i'm going to pass over to my colleague katie hosker to introduce the challenges for the programme. So, uh, hi, Katie. Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks, Natasha. Um, my name is Katie Hosker. I am a systems engineer in our new mobility technology team. And I'm just going to talk through a bit of background to the challenges and then talk through the challenges with you. And then I'll hand off to you, KRI. So, uh, next slide, please. So um, we are a catapult, as Natasha has just explained. So um, within the Connected Places catapult, we have what we call our innovation imperatives. So they are climate action, connected intelligence, and people's experience. And as a catapult, we should be convening and designing, testing and demonstrating, and scaling and having impact. So that's kind of a background as to why we have um, created this this, these challenges really. So we're trying to invest in addressing challenges by removing barriers and sparking innovation so that industry can then address challenges themselves and really kickstart that process. 
So this is looking at the air mobility and airport sector. So um, as part of this kind of project, we started with the Connected Sky Summit, which you may have attended, you may have been aware of, um, which was a huge success. I'll talk a bit about that uh, in a little while. Um, but we took some challenges that we drew out from that summit. Um, and along with that research that we did during the summit, we did some background research and we derived challenges. So I'll, I'll talk again about how we got to those challenges. Um, but then we separated them out into what's really accelerator shape challenges and what's more internal project challenges, what's less suited to an accelerator. So, for example, we are looking at how we can improve accessibility in airports as an internal project challenge. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please, I'll talk a bit about the Connected Sky Summit now. Um, so we held this back in May of this year. It was a huge success. Um, we had over 300 people attend um, the hybrid event with most people attending in person. And we're hoping to turn it into an annual summit with speakers from government, policymakers, academia, startup, big multinationals, you name it, we want them there. Um, and this year, we were really lucky to have um, the Minister for Aviation, Robert Courts MP as well, you can see in the top left hand corner there. So during the summit, we have these lovely boards, which you can see in the centre top picture there, um, where we asked the aviation sector what they saw as the main challenges and opportunities facing the aviation industry um, in various different sectors um, within the aviation industry. Um, and we took those feedback and those challenges that were identified and kind of pulled them into themes. And at the end of day one, we put out a poll to ask the attendees what they saw as the main challenges and the main challenge and the main opportunity in each of those different subcategories. And we pulled that information. And uh, next slide, please. Um, we pulled that information that we got from the Connect the Sky Summit, that feedback, which was really useful and valuable. Um, and we collated that with some internal um, discussions we had with the, um, the key people within the Connected Places Catapult who are um, sub subject matter experts um, to understand what they saw as the challenges and opportunities as well, um, along with some desk-based research. Um, for example, we looked at the Future Flight Challenge Roadmap and we looked at the Jet Zero strategy to pull out some key themes in those challenge areas. And then we took those themes and we prioritised them based on the feedback that we got from the Connected Sky Summit um, and along with what we saw as the, the catapult shaped challenges that we could address. So then we took those to have discussion with our partner organisations that Natasha just showed us now. Um, and we tried to understand what our partners saw as their main challenges as well. And then we came up with our final challenges. So they are, next slide please. Um, the challenges fit into four broad categories. So we've got future airport and vertiport operations. We've got aviation sustainability, future air and space traffic management and enabling end-to-end -end mobility. So if we go on to the next slide, please. Um, I'll just talk through kind of what the general gist of these challenges are. So in the future of airport and vertiport operations, we're really looking at what uh, the technologies, what are the things that we can do to make airport and vertiport operations of the future more efficient and more effective. So for example, how can we ensure that for for example, a vertiport, um, that a passenger doesn't have to arrive two hours before their 15 minute flight to get through security. Um, things like that, how can we make it more um, accessible, efficient, and just generally a better experience? Next slide, please. Um, within the aviation sustainability piece, we're looking at how can we lessen the impact that aviation is having um, and meeting net zero 2050 goals. So it's not just CO2 emissions, it's non-CO2 emissions and the perceived negative impact of aviation, so noise as well. Um, and how can we improve circular economy um, using those net zero fuels uh, and en energy and electrical demand for airports and vertiports as well. Next slide, please. Um, for the future air and space traffic management challenge, we're looking at what's the supporting infrastructure that we need for unmanned traffic management to be integrated within current traffic management. Um, what is the kind of the general infrastructure and the things supporting unmanned air traffic management um, and bringing that into uh, commercialization. Next slide, please. 
And then the final challenge is enabling end-to-end -end mobility. So how can we improve multimodality? How can we um, improve and reduce first and last mile logistics? How can we create a um, connected transport network that's the most efficient and effective it can be um, with aviation at its core? Um, so those are the key challenges. If we go on to the next slide, please. And I will hand over to Simon Masters. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Katie, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I was uh, daydreaming slightly there, and uh, let me just share my slides. There we go. So I'm Simon Masters, I'm the Deputy Director uh, for the Future Flight Challenge, which is uh, delivered by UK Research and Innovation on behalf of the Department for Business in the UK. Uh, what I'm going to do in the next sort of 10 to 15 minutes is give a bit of an overview uh, of the Future Flight Programme, uh, and then really um, sort of share why we are so excited, again, to be working uh, with the Connected Places Catapult on the Accelerator Programme, uh, some of what we learned from last year, and, and I guess um, what we are hoping to see from uh, this year's uh, programme. So the Future Flight Challenge um, is about all things aviation, um, but it's about everything uh, that is not standard aviation. So Whilst there's been an evolution uh, in, in, in manned and unmanned flights over the last 100 or so years, what we're really focusing on are, are three areas. Uh, so drones or, or, or UAS, um, advanced air mobility, and finding sustainable ways to power new aircraft. Now, for us, we've limited ourselves into looking at what we've called sub-regional uh, passenger aircraft. So aircraft with a, a sort of normal operating range of about 500 nautical miles and, and sort of up to 25 to 30 seat size. Um, there are other programs um, under the Jet Zero Council, under the Aerospace Technology Institute that are looking at, at uh, solutions for far bigger aircraft, uh, but for us we're, we're, we're taking it in small steps. So we, uh, about 18 months ago we published an industry roadmap which uh, benefited from the insight and input from uh, various experts across industry, across academia uh, and indeed across government, and that really helped us to kind of home in on some of the key areas uh, that we wanted to focus on and also uh, helped us to develop a, a vision of what the industry might look like firstly in 2024 and then by 2030. And so the following slides give a, a bit of a summary uh, of, of that vision, of that roadmap, uh, and indeed the full document is available on our website. And one of the key things we're very interested in looking at is actually looking at uh, what are the real world use cases for some of these new forms of vehicle. Uh, it, sometimes it feels like for drones in particular, uh, they are a solution looking for a problem. Uh, and we've been amazed by, uh, I guess, the imagination and the scope of, of what organizations are now looking at uh, and how drones and other unmanned aircraft may be able to support uh, communities in the future. And indeed, some of those you can see on the slide uh, on the screen. To do all of this, obviously, that requires us to, to look beyond the traditional aviation industry to work across technology sectors that may not be familiar with us, uh, to work with, uh, with, with catapults, with researchers, uh, with all sorts of people to help us try and develop this ecosystem in which these vehicles will operate in the future. And of course, at the core of this, uh, as with all research, um, there are people, uh, people in terms of, of innovators, uh, people involved in technology, all the way through to passengers, uh, and indeed people who will benefit from these vehicles. And that's why we have a focus on looking at the social benefits and the social desirability uh, of these new vehicles and how they can en enhance uh, the experience for everyone. This slide, um, I, won't, I won't attempt to go into the details, just to show uh, what, a, what a vision could be for 2030 uh, and indeed what some of the, uh, the key factors are. So services, for example, uh, would need to be predictable uh, and sustainable. Um, to pick two on the top left hand corner. So these are some of the key things that we need to consider uh, when we're looking at these new vehicles and um, how in some cases they may replace existing forms of transport or delivery. Uh, and in other cases, how they may indeed form uh, new forms of, of services, new business models, or even ones that we have yet to consider. Uh, some further examples, um, and, and it's really been exciting to see uh, how some of this is already beginning. So. I think at the start of our program in 2019, 
Um, we genuinely thought that we were working uh, with delivery firms, uh, looking at last mile delivery of, of parcels um, to, to people's homes, to businesses. Um, that is still the case to an extent, but even more so we have seen interest from emergency services from the NHS in looking at how drones can be used to deliver vital functions uh, across health and social care, uh, across policing, across fire and rescue. And so it's really interesting to see how, how the market, how the industry is starting to really capture uh, some of these opportunities and, and start to really push these forward. So what have we done so far? Uh, so our phase two uh, projects, uh, most of which are completing um, over this summer period, uh, these were 48 projects uh, of which we uh, contributed 33 uh, and a bit million from our uh, from our future flight fund of, of public funding, uh, covering all of the sorts of topics um, that I've already mentioned, and really generating some great interest uh, from the media, from the public, um, and we're, we're very proud of what those uh, what those projects have achieved. And there you can see uh, a picture of say a thousand words. Uh, these are some of the vehicles, some of the aircraft, some of the demonstrations uh, that that were part of those successful projects. Uh, so electric aircraft, hybrid electric aircraft, um, drones, uh, and starting to work with the sort of large end customers like the Royal Mail. As well as that, uh, we funded a number of projects specifically focused on addressing uh, some of the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and, and looking at how drones specifically could support vital government functions uh, such as healthcare, such as uh, key infrastructure inspection. So where are we now? Uh, we are about to launch our, or are launching currently, our third phase of projects. Um, and whilst these form the centerpiece of what we're doing as a team, there are a lot of other activities going on um, on this slide, as you can see around the outside of the central arrow. Um, a lot of other things that are needed and a lot of other organizations um, that we're working with, and, and some of them are also uh, now part of this uh, accelerator program, such as the CAA and, and BSI. Uh, and really the purpose of this slide is just to highlight the fact that Whilst we are very proud to be funding uh, some very exciting, very innovative R&D, we're also um, convening a lot of other discussions, working groups, uh, social science um, research, to really try and uh, build as much as possible the wider system in which these, uh, these vehicles will operate. And that's something that um, we're very keen to, to include uh, organisations that, that come through the Accelerator programme uh, would be very welcome to sort of join in these discussions, as indeed with those who are not successful, um, we, we, we don't have all the information, we don't have all the knowledge and good ideas. We really do need to speak to, speak to people across the industry uh, who are active in these areas and who may be able to help um, challenge some of our thinking and, and, and take forward um, some of the ideas and concepts that are needed. So that's our, our phase two projects. These are starting to, uh, to launch now over the summer and, and we, will, we will undoubtedly hear more from them uh, as they get up and running and, and start to deliver the exciting work that they've got. Um, I'll say a bit more now just about the accelerator program. So um, as, as Natasha and Katie said last year, that we were very proud to take part uh, as a sponsor uh, of the accelerator. This was the first time for us as a team that we'd been involved in, in the accelerator program. Uh, and it was uh, really exciting, really refreshing uh, to see uh, a different approach to, to providing funding. Um, and, and certainly compared to how we as, as UKRI operate, it was fantastic to see uh, smaller projects, small amounts of funding, but achieving almost as much, or in some cases, perhaps more than some of the very large projects we have. It's a real testament to what could be done quickly uh, when you have smaller projects um, and, and visionary um, <clears throat> individuals, what can be done in a short space of time uh, and what can be done when smaller organizations have the opportunity to work uh, with, with partners. Uh, and, and that will continue um, with this year's program with the opportunity to work with some of the other companies and organizations who you'll hear from uh, next. So that, that was really fantastic for us. It did challenge some of our thinking. It allowed us to explore uh, some technologies, some approaches to, to aviation that we hadn't considered. Um, and so it was, it was fantastic to um, see all of that. Uh, and, and some of the testimonies we had, um, uh, which, which um, Natasha and colleagues had, had shared with us previously, um, it was really great to hear organizations who took part actually um, telling us how they benefited from it uh, in, in measurable terms, such as um, creating new jobs, securing, uh, securing investment, um, opening new offices overseas. There's such a raft of, of really uh, exciting benefits that the organizations uh, that took part 
got from this. Um, that's why we're, we're really happy to be to be back and taking part in this year's um, uh, this year's program again. Uh, so what I would say uh, in closing is uh, we're really looking forward again uh, to supporting this program, and we're really looking forward to, to working with those who, who take part. Uh, and we are all, of course, whether people are taking part or not, we're always very happy to engage uh, right across the, the sort of aviation sector in the areas that we're looking at. Uh, and we're very happy, even though we've spent quite a lot of time and effort producing a roadmap, it is only um, a, a sort of our view of the future. And we're very happy to have conversations and to be challenged. Um, it's absolutely not going to be what the future looks like. Um, so please uh, come and talk to us, ask questions, and if any of the other um, uh, activities that we have, such as our working groups on airspace integration, on safety, on community integration, if any of those are things that are interesting to you, then please also do come and get in touch. And I'm sure these will be circulated, but those are my details. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, for your time today. Thank you, Simon. We're really excited to be working with you too. Um, I'd just like to introduce our speakers from Supernal now, one of our partners. They're going to talk about what they did on the previous programme. So introducing Chase and Andrew from Supernal. Welcome. Hey, good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me get our, our slides pulled up here. All right. Uh, so thank you for the introduction, Natasha. Uh, wanted to go through a little bit of the background uh, for Supernal uh, and who we are and how we came to be and the interactions that we've had through the Connected Places Catapult uh, and, and how we've benefited from it as well as some of the continuing conversations we've been having with some of the SMEs uh, throughout the, the course of the year. Uh, Quick background on myself, uh, and I'll hand over to Andrew to, to do his introduction as well. I'm Chase Lakovsky, I'm an investment manager here at Supernal. Uh, my background is, is mostly in military aviation, spent a lot of time on the F-35 and F-22 programs, uh, working their production sustainment efforts. Um, and here at Supernal, you know, we're looking at ways to uh, support and, and help with the innovation that's coming out of all the small startups, as well as some of the medium-sized companies that are looking for those projects and those partners to take to uh, to the ecosystem uh, to really make sure that we help uh, advance their mobility become a reality for everybody. Uh, with that, Andrew, do you want to do an introduction as well? Sure. Thanks, Chase, um, and good morning, good afternoon to all of you in the UK. Uh, Andrew Kuzmik here. I'm on our commercial partnerships team, mostly focused on partnerships in the ecosystem and infrastructure, right? So everything outside of, of the aircraft itself. Um, my background is in urban planning and infrastructure economics, um, and more recently, uh, business development for software and data analytics companies uh, focused on, on transportation and, and the built environment. Um, so very excited to, to meet all of you and, and uh, see what you're, you're up to. Next slide, Jay. Okay, so a little bit of background on Hyundai Motor Group. Um, many people don't realize that Hyundai Motor Group actually started as an infrastructure company um, in the post-war period, building uh, roads and highways across Korea. It wasn't until the 1960s that, that Hyundai um, became a, a motor vehicle company and of course became very well known um, in the late 1990s for having the, the industry's best automotive warranty. In the 2000s, Hyundai has become one of the, um, the world's greatest innovators in a number of, of different technologies, including electric powertrains, hydrogen powertrains. Um, and in 2020, uh, announced our, our ambitions as, as Hyundai Motor Group to, um, to enter into the, the world of air mobility with um, the, our SA1 concept vehicle being unveiled at the 2020 CES. Um, next slide. Hyundai Motor Group today consists of uh, 53 different affiliates. And in many ways, you can think of Supernal as a pointy tip of the spear integrating capabilities across the, the motor group. So we have a, a, a very large um, 
number of, of relevant affiliate companies that can help to, um, to bring air mobility into reality. Next slide, Chase. So how does Supernal fit in? Supernal is Hyundai Motor Group's long-term commitment to develop the advanced air mo mobility industry. And I think our, our guiding stars are our intentions to, to help build human-centered cities that leverage innovative mobility solutions and technology advancements to deliver affordable and universal mobility services. Um, so as we go through um, it, the rest of the presentation, you'll um, come to understand that, that Hyundai is not necessarily looking to be a first mover in terms of launching our aircraft. Um, we're really uh, thinking of this in a strategic second mover advantage where, um, where we're coming to the market a little bit later with our aircraft and with our technology, but bringing it to scale much more quickly. Um, again, with that eye towards developing affordable and universal mobility services. Over to you, Chase. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, and, and like Andrew mentioned, at uh, the CES uh, in 2020, we unveiled the SA-1 concept, uh, which is shown here. Um, and we've, we've continued to refine and define that model as we move towards our, our entry into service of 2028 for exactly those reasons, right? We want to make sure that um, all of the components needed to support a viable, sustainable, equitable, uh, advanced air mobility ecosystem exists uh, when our aircraft actually comes to market. Uh, so with that, we're, we're looking at uh, driving the ecosystem development more broadly across uh, advanced air mobility. Um, so there's the vehicle and subsystems, which are extremely important um, and, and really are the, the mode and touch point for a lot of the users who will be in, uh, uh, taking part in their daily commute on hopefully a supernal uh, UAM vehicle one day. Uh, but there's other really important aspects of it. Um, there's UAM operations, uh, like we're looking at through the, the CPC uh, areas in the, the vertiports and making sure that uh, our goal to save you from an hour commute with a 15 minute flight isn't ruined by 30 minutes of processing on either side of that uh, commute to get you even onto the aircraft. Uh, we want to make sure that there's a viable, robust uh, aftermarket to support, maintain these vehicles and, and help keep the cost down uh, for the average consumer. And lastly, there's infrastructure. Uh, not only is there physical infrastructure that we need to, to build to be able to, to land in more places than just airports uh, and to really integrate with communities, but also the, the uh, digital infrastructure to help move data uh, and ensure that these are operating safely and communicating with each other um, across the entire ecosystem. We, we do this by leaning on both the commercial engine of, of Hyundai with its 53 affiliate networks to help us with all of the manufacturing needs that we have. But there's also a lot of areas where we're looking to, to bring in and employ strategic partnerships uh, across that whole ecosystem. Um, that could be anything from manufacturing and vehicle solutions um, all the way up to uh, thought leadership in, in data processing and, and how you do uh, autonomy and train AI models um, that help fly these aircraft eventually. Uh, we do this also with developing consortia across the public and private sectors. Um, it's important to gain public trust, uh, not only with the large scale regulators like the UKCAA or FAA, uh, but also with more local governments. Uh, a homeowners association might be just as likely to stop a uh, vertiport being built, uh, then your, your larger government uh, organizations are gonna be. So we really wanna make sure that we're bringing this to the community. And it's not just socially acceptable, it's, it's socially desirable and a good thing to have in your communities. Um, and lastly, we'll, we'll integrate all those things with, with our um, experience with Hyundai Motor Group and, and really try to help be good stewards of that ecosystem uh, as we, we bring our uh, product to market. Uh, with that, we've been uh, working with the Connected Places Catapults uh, last year uh, and had a lot of great interactions. So we just wanted to highlight a couple of those. For anybody who might be considering applying, we, we really recommend uh, doing it and using some of the expertise provided not just by us, but through the rest of the sponsors and, and CPC uh, to help get more people uh, involved in this ecosystem and help solve some of these challenging problems we have. Uh, one of those was a, a company called SiteTech, which was uh, doing visual navigation solutions and, and helping make our autonomous vehicle potentially fly. Uh, we did some testing between them uh, and Cranfield University, and we're able to 
uh, uh, test and validate their product. And we have a continuing uh, commercial relationship being discussed with them today. Uh, and I'll actually let Andrew talk with the next few since he was kind of the, the primary lead on these. All right. So uh, this is this is a really cool example. DM Tech is building um, micro wind and weather data analytics that can be used for things like vertport site selection, um, corridor planning for air mobility vehicles, and um, a number of other uh, potential future use cases. Um, and through the accelerator program, we really uh, helped them with their product development as well as commercialization of their product. Um, and similar to SciTech, we um, have a commercial partnership that is established with the Ameritech coming out of the program. Um, so it was really amazing to see what they were able to do in a short period of time in terms of um, building out their product to, um, to meet some of the, the needs that we have and, and, and really kind of listening keenly to what we were saying as, as kind of sponsors and mentors, but also reading between the lines um, to come up with innovative solutions that, that we weren't even really anticipating. Um, so really, really exciting example there. Next slide. Here's another trial project um, that we partnered on through the CPC program with a company called Tech Tower. Um, Tech Tower is developing um, alternate, alternate reality and, and virtual reality simulation tools um, for complex multi-stakeholder planning and coordination. So you can imagine how using, um, using video game technology uh, you might be able to convene both public sector and private sector partners to start to sketch out and really envision, um, you know, an, an air mobility ecosystem within a, a, a particular city or um, or geographic boundary. And a really exciting project for us to work on. Their technology um, is still pretty pretty early, so. Um, while we continue to have a really good relationship with Tech Tower, we, um, we have not brought their technology into service, so to speak, um, at this point. Um, but another great example of, you know, how a, a product has, has grown so much over just a short period of time. Next slide, Chase. And this was a, a, a really fun partnership with, with Commonplace. So, um, as many of you may know, Hyundai is partnered with and supports a company called Urban Airport um, that is developing modular, scalable air mobility infrastructure. Urban Airport had a um, had their their commercial launch in Coventry earlier this year, and uh, we were connected with Commonplace through the Connected Places Catapult program, where Commonplace was able to bring their community engagement platform. Um, and test it in a live environment um, alongside the launch of Urban Airport's um, infrastructure solution. So we use Commonplace to sort of measure uh, community sentiment um, and really uncover a lot of the perspectives across an enormous number of stakeholders and, and members of the community as they were experiencing air mobility infrastructure um, live and, and in person for the first time. Um, so that that was a really cool example where we could we could partner on a trial, but actually test that that um, technology in a live environment. Back to you, Chase. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the the last one uh, we wanted to highlight is a company called Radar Technologies, and unfortunately, we actually ended up not working with them through the uh, Connected Places Catapult, just through our own bandwidth and the, the number of companies that we, we wanted to work with, but just couldn't support at the time. Uh, but we actually, we started having great conversations with them and understanding the solutions uh, and what they were, were building. It was kind of elegantly simple. Uh, and so we decided to, to really explore some applications in the advanced air mobility ecosystem with them further. Uh, and, and we're actually still actively ongoing these conversations and, and trying to understand how do we unlock this um, and, and make it to where it makes the entire uh, journey safer uh, and the vehicles more uh, performant in the uh, entire ecosystem. Uh, so with that, I believe that is our last slide. Uh, and I will hand it back over to CPC to go into the next one.
Thank you. Thank you. It was just fantastic to see all those examples of all the SMEs you guys were working with. Um, let's do more this year. Um, okay, I'm going to introduce our next speakers from Cranfield, Veronica Rigby and Antonius. Um, so if you guys would like to share your screens, that would be great. And we're looking forward to hearing from you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I will start, Veronica, and you can uh, cover the second part um, uh, here, which is, which is, I think, the most important part for, 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 for this particular uh, event. A, a small introduction to the uh, Cranfield University before we, uh, Veronica, start cover more the EBIT class and uh, uh, around here. Um, next page, Veronica. Uh, I don't know how many of you know uh, Cranfield. Cranfield it is the only uh, exclusively postgraduate uh, university at the uh, United uh, Kingdom. It is located between um, Cambridge and, and Oxford, near to Milton Keynes. And um, it is a university that it is engaged more with uh, industry uh, than uh, any other in UK, at least. Uh, uh, and that is because it is uh, only postgraduate uh, university, focusing in uh, only on some of the uh, domains. Uh, and in the next slides, there will be some uh, uh, companies that were involved. Here it is, uh, and that's not an ex uh, exhaustive list, but you can see we working with all the big uh, OEMs like uh, Airbus and Rolls-Royce, BA Systems and, uh, and, uh, and Boeing. Uh, airlines like uh, British Airways and, and EasyJet, uh, airports like uh, Heathrow, and, and, so, and, 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 and so on. Um, the next one, uh, Veronica. Um, you, we, we are a small uh, university with around four and a half thousand uh, postgraduate uh, students. Uh, uh, we are ranked uh, in the top 50 in the world in engineering, uh, and when you look in mechanical, aeronautical and, and, and manufacturing. And uh, we have been uh, awarded uh, six times in Queen's anniversary prize. Uh, with the last time to be for the flying classroom, because we we having uh, not only our airport but also our own uh, aircraft that uh, delivers education for all around the the, the country. Uh, next one, uh, Veronica. Uh, as I said, we don't cover all the to all the domains uh, on all the topics. Confield it is uh, um, organized around themes, and the themes we cover it is aerospace, transport, manufacturing, uh, energy and power. We're looking about uh, infrastructure uh, and renewable energy, environment and, and agri food, uh, uh, water and uh, defense and security. This is the eight themes that the university it is um, it is focused. Here, the aerospace and transport systems, it is the ones that they are the more uh, relevant uh, to this uh, accelerator. Next one. Um, the university has gone to a um, transformation in the last uh, years with more than uh, 100 million investment in aerospace and aviation related uh, 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 facilities. And um, as, as, as I mentioned, it, uh, it has its own airport, it has its own aircraft, and it has its own a navigation service provider, which means, makes that uh, uh, unique in both in the UK, but also in the uh, Europe. Uh, next one, Veronica. This is just give you um, 
a, an idea of the facilities we're having in, in the university. Um, we we having our own airport with our own navigation system. We having a digital um, uh, air traffic center uh, with this. Uh, it's looking how the remote towers can operate and integrate in the airport. It's a fully operational uh, uh, digital tower. We having um, um, uh, a part of a um, uh, smart city in the multi-user environment uh, for autonomous vehicle and, uh, innovation. We can look in there the infrastructure that enables both uh, autonomous cars and drones operating in an urban environment. Um, we having um, a BB loss uh, area that enables um, uh, drones and unmanned uh, uh, platforms to operate it in non-segregated uh, airspace. We having our own uh, uh, flying platform that's the sub um, 340 that enables uh, uh, to uh, uh, to test uh, different uh, technologies that um, um, become bring more digital uh, utilizations of a new aircraft. We having our own living laboratory, which can look in the noise and pollutions uh, around the uh, areas that uh, we are uh, we are interested. Um, I will not cover the Avid Plus and the e Labs because this one we covered in more details from uh, uh, Veronica. All right. Next one. Uh, the Digital uh, Aviation Research Technology Center. It was uh, open. Uh, relatively uh, recent. It covers both uh, the unmanned traffic management, but uh, also distributed uh, airport and airspace management when we look in airport and vertiports operating uh, in, in the same area. It start looking about the uh, position navigation systems. Uh, it start looking about um, uh, connectivity for both uh, uh, air to air and air to, to ground. We start looking the the whole journey of the passengers and how we can take in door to door and uh, become more seamless uh, and um, more enjoyable for the 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 passengers. But along that one, we're looking also the cyber resilience, the environmental uh, resilience, and also the business cases uh, around the the whole digital aviation. Um, Next one. And we have also the aerospace integration research centers, what uh, uh, it is uh, looking for the platform designs from the drones to the urban air mobility. It is including uh, the uh, a new uh, UAM flight simulator in, inside, plus uh, also the a uh, new uh, management for uh, uh, different propulsion systems for greener uh, uh, air platforms. And Veronica? Yeah, next slide. That's uh, you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Veronica Rigby. Um, I'm a um, business development manager for Aviate Plus, and I also lead on Cranfield's incubation support. So uh, thank you, Antonios. So just to uh, give you a little bit of context about our, our incubation uh, facilities, uh, Cranfield is a designated university enterprise zone and we were awarded uh, 1.2 million by Research England to support the growth of an aerospace and Avtech business cluster. So this funding enabled development of a new facility called Aviate Plus which um, operates uh, directly alongside our existing uh, Cranfield Eagle Lab. Um, the Eagle Lab um, was developed in partnership with Barclays and it's a successful uh, business incubator facility for early stage companies in the aerospace and avtech sector. Uh, the new AV8 Plus facility um, provides grow on space and tailored business support for high growth companies as they move forward along their journey. So uh, this is just a picture of the outside of the Eagle Lab. Uh, the facilities are uh, co-located with the university. Um, the picture that Antonio showed you uh, of the Global Research Airport, 
airport we are directly in in the heart of, of that space so the the eagle lab has a, a dedicated uh, management team um, has a combination of uh, private offices a, a co-working space uh, a fully equipped maker space and also uh, access to university expertise and wider facilities um, it also has a dedicated entrepreneur in residence uh, the new Aviate facility, which uh, we had a, um, a soft launch uh, last year, um, uh, supported by um, the MP for uh, Small Business, Paul Scully, and uh, we opened this year, quite a few delays, unfortunately, due to COVID, but we, we are open and up and running. Um, this, uh, again, we have a combination of uh, co-working desks, private workshops, um, both facilities um, offer a tailored programme of support to companies. Um, obviously, uh, being situated uh, right next to the university, uh, we have the advantage of being able to give companies access to the academic expertise, uh, world-class facilities, and obviously the highly skilled uh, graduates. Uh, the centre also has um, a dedicated entrepreneur in residence, and um, also we are supporting some exciting new initiatives, including um, a drone innovation hub, which is being led by Cranfield University in partnership with uh, companies Neuron and Ebony uh, to give a, an extra dimension of support to uh, small businesses. Now, if you go onto the website, there is a, a virtual tool and we're also always uh, you know, open to welcome you to, to come and have a, a physical tour around the facilities, but I'll just, uh, just a few um, pictures to show you, uh, which is the outside of the building. Uh, this space has seven private workshops which enable sort of larger scale prototyping so like as we say uh, as I said the companies that are sort of growing uh, getting into that sort of larger scale needing larger scale facilities uh, we have these private workshop areas uh, there's also uh, a fully equipped maker space in this building and companies in both facilities uh, you know can can move between both in terms of accessing equipment and support um, the spaces are supported by um, a, a full-time lab engineer and uh, between the two facilities, uh, we look to support um, really companies at any stage in their journey. We have a range of uh, membership options. Um, as I said, access to all the university expertise, uh, access to Cranfield's networks. And um, we, I also sit within our research and innovation office. So there's a lot of support there in terms of uh, support with um, funding opportunities, uh, commercialization and IP um, support. So that's hopefully just given you a, a flavor. Um, I, I probably will mention actually referring to uh, one of the companies that I mentioned previously, we were delighted to be able to, uh, I'll give you an example, uh, one of the companies, DMA Tech, uh, we're working quite closely with them still. We were able to give them support to help them set up a UK base and delighted that they are they're now based at Cranfield. Um, so really, um, I think uh, hopefully that's given a flavour of, of what we can offer. But I think just I think on behalf of the university, myself and Antonio, say we're just delighted to be supporting the programme again and really looking forward to meeting the next cohort. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, really great to see all the facilities and, and hear from you guys. So thanks for joining. Leanne, um, can you please share the slides again for the second section on joining the Accelerator Programme. So next slide, please. Why would you join the Accelerator Programme? I'm gonna get into the, the, the detail now. Um, well, we do have up to 30K in funding for each SME uh, for the trying and testing of live demonstrations. We will also be providing investment support, business development support, technical support, bespoke coaching and mentoring, and we'll be focusing on your growth and your trial over the six months, ending with the demonstration day um, to showcase your solution. Next slide, please. CPC provides two program stream, streams, technical and commercial. Uh, next slide, please. And just to give a little bit more detail on that, this is a rough timeline. As you can see, the only firm dates we have in there are Welcome Day on the 1st of November 
and Demo Day on the 27th of April. They are in-person London events you need to be able to attend. Um, we will then be filling out this calendar with a series of in-person and virtual workshops, networking, events, mentorship, um, you know, support in, in the form of investment readiness, grants, um, marketing support, etc. So we're just designing that out now. And we will be waiting until we select the cohort so that it can be bespoke to you. Um, it's quite light touch in terms of we do understand that you have got things to do. So we'll check in with you. You know, I'll, we'll put the the meeting in once a week, but we can move it around as appropriate. Um, and we won't expect more than um, a day um, of your time a month. So at the bottom here, drawing your attention to the kind of overall plan, we'll be scoping out trials over November and December. In January, we will be looking at technical support to uh, support that trial. We'll launch the trial in February. In March, we will deliver the trial and finish it up in April. So next slide, please, Leanne. How to apply? Well, I have a QR code here to take you straight to the application page. You will need to create a profile to allow us to collect basic information from you and then the actual application form. This also allows you to dip in and out of the form until closing date so that you can edit your submission um, and, and sort of work on it over a period of time. Um, you will be asked to submit that proposal for what you would do with up to 30K of trial funding. Funding is not guaranteed. We'll, we'll, we will be assessing that proposal. And what is the eligibility criteria? Well, you must be an SME. You must have or are willing to register a UK company address. This is a requirement to unlock the trial funding, but we can support you in, in doing that. On the form, there is a company's house number field. If you are not registered, just put not applicable. Your technology must be TRL 6 or higher if you need to... Um, know what TRLs are and um, do search them online. And you must be able to address one or more of the sub challenge statements with your technology. Uh, yeah, and as I said, there's a QR code here, but if you follow us on LinkedIn, we posted about it. If I've contacted you, I would have sent you the link. You can always um, Google to find that application form. Some key dates to go through. We are closing applications on the 11th of September. That is a Sunday. So if you want to cram it all in on the weekend, you do have those extra two days. We will then be creating a shortlist and the shortlist will be invited to interview on the 29th or 30th of September for your technical due diligence interviews. You will need to be available for a slot over one of those days. Same for the final interviews, you'll need to be available for a slot over the 3rd or 4th of October. We will be having some calls with the winning cohort uh, actually before Welcome Day to just scope out the trials, just so we have a little bit of an idea about what that's going to look like so that it can help frame, frame Welcome Day. And finally, Demi Day is the 27th of April. Location to be confirmed. Finally, the scoring criteria. It is equally scored, 25% weighted to all four areas. On the solution side, we're looking at whether your product is innovative with clear USPs and has your technology developed. Traction and financials, we will be looking at whether you have traction to demonstrate that product market fit and whether you're already working with clients. Do you have the team to, um, you know, with the needed experience? And finally, program fit. Does your proposal actually align to the challenge of the program and is a trial feasible? So next slide, please. 
we actually have come to the end of of the, the the slides part of the webinar so a huge thank you for listening to all of us and we now have time for questions so please enter any questions you have into the question panel and i will answer it live or i'll pass the baton on to someone else um, who's presented today who can also answer um there are flies went to my forehead that's lovely so please do pop your questions into the question panel. Um, I hope that we've answered everything. We will try to be very thorough, but if you do have any questions, pop them into the question box. What is the role of the programme partners? So the programme partners are there to work with you on trial. So not every program partner will work with every SME. Um, you saw with Supernal, they worked with four SMEs, I think, and they are there to work on the trials with you and then offer their expertise um, and, and guidance. D does anyone have anything to add from that? Uh, Andrew from Supernal or, or anyone else who spoke today wanted to add to that on the role of the program partners? Nope. Okay. Can you reconfirm time resources at our end? Is it one day per month or week? So we'll just have a weekly check in. That's just like a half an hour meeting. And then it will be sort of no more. I believe it's no more than two days a month. Um, I'll have to check on that. As I said, we haven't really scoped it out, but we. We do this a lot and we're aware that you guys are very busy with other things. So questions are coming in thick and fast. Just on that last question about time and resources, just note that it is a bespoke programme, so we will sort of vary the support depending on what you specifically need. Um, we are not sharing the slides afterwards, but we will be sharing a link to this webinar. So I will be putting that on the website. What is the last date that the technology needs to be ready for in that timeline? Um, Katie wants to answer it live. Katie, are you able to help me with that? Sorry, I'm just making sure that they're visible to everyone. It's, it's you, you go for it. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not quite sure what this person means. Um, what was the last set of technology needs to be ready? I'm not sure what you mean, unfortunately. If you could just maybe ask it again. I think um, maybe they mean, so when you say you've got to be TRL level six, what, at what point does it need to be TRL level six? when you apply so now um i believe um oh. yeah so there's a there's a okay TRL. we should explain that a bit more so if the company is trl level four but they can demonstrate they can move up to six very quickly a grants available yes yeah, so we are actually um we are quite flexible we say trl six but you know, if you think that you are appropriate for this program, please do apply and explain um, why you think that you can move up to six quite quickly. Um, so if you're an international applicant and you're not currently registered in the UK, um, you can still apply and basically you can't receive the funding until you're registered in the UK so we'll help you do that but yeah it needs to be sort of near the beginning otherwise we won't be able to run the trial with you um someone's asked about whether they need to touch base with the program partners before the application um you don't need to do that just have a think about how you would like to work with one or more of the program partners what the trial would look like. It's all sort of hypothetical at this stage. You're putting a proposal down of what you would uh, like to do with one or more of them. And it's not every single partner. It's it's just the ones that, that have synergies with your solution. Uh, 
Uh, team structure, we don't have any expectations around team structure. We just need to know that you have the expertise um, to do what you say you're going to do. Sorry, the questions are coming in thick and fast. So that's great. Is the 30K for trial funding the total cost of the trial? Or could you use it as part of funding for more expensive trial? I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, and just to know, it is up to 30K. So it's, it's not necessarily all of that money. It depends on what your proposal is. Um, but yeah, if you want, I think if you want to contribute funding to add on to that, then that's that's okay. Can a previous CPC employee and Cranfield graduate apply? Yes, we uh, are not uh, biased. We don't have any issues with that. Okay. Uh, follow up to my further question. We are in development and still would be through the early stage of the six month accelerator program. I was wondering what date we would need to complete with the tech. Still don't understand what you mean. If just, I think you should apply and just be clear about where you are and we will contact you with um, our decision. I think that's a that's a good, or, or maybe just email me, my email's on the screen and we can, we can chew this one over and, and get you an answer. Um, someone's asking about being a UK registered company. As I said, you don't need to be UK registered yet. You just need to do it to gain the funding. So we need to look into doing that when you're accepted. So it will be a conceptual design to demo day. Not sure what that means demo day is basically uh we will be showcasing what you've achieved on the program with the different partners for the trials do you expect in person in uk or virtual we do expect um some in-person attendance so even if you're abroad you will need to travel down for um various events not all of the events are in person there's there's plenty of virtual stuff um, and then for the trials, if, if there is some in-person stuff, then we will require um, physical attendance, yes. If one side of technology is mature, but the other side isn't, we're definitely still interested in hearing about you, hearing from you, so please do apply. Uh, yeah, the partners are the ones at the bottom of the page. I spoke about them earlier in the in the presentation, and we heard from three of them today. So you would be partnering with, uh, yeah, one or more. It's all very bespoke, and we'll just work with you to work out the, the best way to try your solution. Um, there's a question about the, there is a question about space-based solutions. Um, Katie, are you available to answer this? It's about the challenges and whether we're interested in space-based space, space -based solutions. Um, sure. So, um, very good question. Are you interested in space-based solutions? Seems to focus this on UAVs, drones, etc., but not on satellites and other types of spacecraft. Is that correct? If not, what space solutions are areas could be of interest. So I guess the thing to bear in mind with this is we're looking at transport. So we're looking at transporting people. If it's a space based solution, I don't think we're excluding that. We've deliberately kept um, one of the challenges as air and space. So it's not exclusive. Um, it, space isn't an exclusion criteria, um, but it depends exactly what your solution is, if that answers your question. Thank you, Katie. Um, someone says, what's your anticipated exception rate onto the programme? 12 isn't many. 12 is the most that we've ever had on any programme. So it's going to be maximum 12 and um, not necessarily 12. 
So we need to be able to provide, you know, bespoke support to everyone. Um, can the application be joined from another SME? I haven't heard of this happening before. Um, so I'm going to say apply separately and maybe mention the other SME in your proposal. And I'll let you know if I find out that I am wrong. Um, someone's asked about the webinar again. Yeah, we will be putting the webinar recording onto our website. Who are the judges? The, the CPC will be doing the shortlisting and CPC will be doing the technical due diligence interviews, which are basically just pre-interviews for the final interviews. The final interviews will be with the partners and the partners will have final say. Okay, I've just had uh, some information about uh, a consortium, so applying jointly. Um, you can apply together if you want to, um, um, but it is rare and you'd have to split the funding between you. So maybe if you both got on, you could have more funding and pull it together. What is the duration of the project? It's a six month program. Would CBC or partners claim any IP developed through the accelerator? No, we are um, independent and part government funded and we do not do that. Um, what if we have, I've, someone's asking about TRL6 again. Um, I've, I've said that it's okay if you're lower than TRL6, you just need to explain why you think that you're applicable to the program. But yeah, we, we generally do say TRL6 or above. Is it possible for us to select the mentors and partners on the program? Um, not 100% sure, sure what you mean by that, but basically these are the partners. You will have the opportunity to work with any of them. And if you have specific um, introductions that you want to be made, or you want to work with a specific mentor, then we can see what we can do, um, sort of beyond the, the partners that are listed at the bottom of this slide. Okay, I think that is all the unique questions. So I, I thank you so much for listening to me babble through that. Um, my email is on the screen. Please email me if you don't think I've answered your question properly or you have more questions or whatever. Um, we're going to be putting the recording onto the website. And thank you very much for joining us for an hour and 15 minutes. Have a lovely afternoon. <laughs>